I don't know. Nakatomi Plaza, though. Mm. Oh my god, Die Hard's so good. I gotta watch Die Hard again. Ah, today's video is brought to you by the wonderful people over at Longtime Partner, Friend, Glorious Sponsor, Squarespace. Thank you so much, Squarespace. You make it all possible, as do you, dear viewers. We make it all possible together. Check out Squarespace at squarespace.com forward slash blaze and you'll get 10% off your first purchase. And now today's video. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. I, as always, am Blaze Boy, a uh, boy with the Blaze Backed Boy. Packed Boy is kind of the one I've ultimately settled on. Yo, this is massive uh, movies that led to massive lawsuits. So, seems like another video where we're gonna be sh all over companies, which I know you all enjoy because those are the videos that get us the most views. That's why we make more of them. Yes! So, without much further ado, let us begin. Oh, there will be some further ado, actually. <laughs> actually, actually. Ah, uh, Sam, uh, no, Danny. Danny writes it, I read it, Sam sprinkles in the finest of vintage memes. That's what's going on here. I'm adjusting the lighting a little bit, I apologise. I got a new lighting set up, and I want to make sure it's not shit, because it's expensive. <laughs> Let's go! Painfully strict, ma'am. As the pale moonlight devilishly danced over Gotham City one dark night in 2008, the master vigilante known as Batman prepared for the ultimate showdown with his greatest ever foe. Uh, most people like Simon, I can't believe you've actually seen the Batman movies. I quite enjoy the Batman movies. Those ones that uh, Christopher Nolan did with uh, Christian Bale. Is it Christopher Nolan? Now I'm doubting that because it's also Christian Bale. Were they both called Christopher? That's confusing. Um, although it's a relatively common name, so I guess not so much. What am I talking about? Oh, I liked those movies. I thought the one with, um, oh, what's his face? The strange guy. Joaquin Phoenix. That was really intense. Like, I'm not, I didn't enjoy it. It was, I was a good, it was a good movie. But it's one of those movies you go and it's like, we couldn't have just like, throughout the, there couldn't have been like three seconds of levity. I feel like that, I remember leaving that movie and just saying to my wife, I just feel like that movie was punching me in the face for two hours and not even like letting up. It was just like, oh, hello, welcome to Joker, where it's just filled with misery and horror for two hours. Even horror movies have moments of like levity. That movie was just like, ah, oh, ah, oh, so why? Ah. Oh. And then when I left, I felt a big, I was just like, oh, okay, I feel like I need a drink. <laughs> It wasn't the Joker or the Penguin, what are we talking about? Oh, Batman's greatest foe. It wasn't the Joker, the Penguin, the Riddler. It wasn't even George Clooney. Wait, George Clooney. I haven't seen the old Batman movies, of course. No, it was a battle against a Turkish guy named Hussein Kalkan. And he was the mayor of a city called Batman. Wait, there's a city in Turkey called Batman? That's fantastic. Following the massive box office success of Christian Bale's second outing as hero, as the hero with uh, serious anger issues in The Dark Knight, Warner Bros. and Chris and director Christopher Nolan. Oh, they are both called Christian. Ah, and oh no, it's Christian. It's not Christopher Bale. What am I talking about? <laughs> well done, Simon. You wasted a solid minute on that. While everyone thinks you're an absolute moron. Great. Carry on. Uh, they were reportedly hit with the lawsuit from the mayor of the ancient oil-rich city of Batman in southeast Anatolia, Turkey. I guess they all ran out. They were like, yeah, yeah, we're super rich and all, but we're going to do frivolous lawsuits against American companies. Ah. The lawsuit was demanding a massive slice of the movie's billion dollar profits as Mayor Kalkin reckoned that Warner Bros had been using the name of the city without permission. He also alleged that the psychological impact of the film's success had directly led to an increase in crime in the namesake city, a spike in unsolved murders, and even a rise in young female suicides. Holy smoke! Um, also, what an absolute load of tosh. Who that- wh where is- he's gonna sue them in Turkey or America? I mean, I feel like even in America, it's like super litigious culture. They're going to be like, uh, no. Next. And in Turkey, I don't know how to... Look, I don't know much about Turkey. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I imagine its legal system is not... And this, this... I mean, I don't want to praise the US legal system. But I imagine it's going to be like... Better than Turkey's? I don't know. Turkish people are probably watching me like, Hey, Simon! Why are you doing Italian accent for the Turkish... I don't know. I'm already rearing, rearing into this being a bit racist, aren't I? So let's just stop. Look, I don't know, Turkey, you, you, you just seem a little bit, you know, I don't want to see, you're president, all right? Let's just leave it at that. That's racist! What's going on? 
There was one aspect of the reported lawsuit which did appear as if the citizens of Batman might have been treated a little unfairly. The mayor claimed the Hollywood executives had made it tricky for local business owners to use the name of their own city when trying to set up a business abroad. Wait, but their local business? Oh, I'm so confused. One former, oh, okay, so they're expanding internationally and they want to set up like Batman Turkish restaurant in Germany. Um, okay, yeah, I can see why that's going to be a problem, but just call it something else. I mean, just why, like, or just call it Batman. They're not going to sue you, are they? I don't know. That's confusing. One former resident now living in Germany even claimed that the producers of the Batman movies had interve intervened when he unsuccessfully tried to name his restaurants in honor of his homeland. If that's true, it does seem a little harsh that Hollywood is clipping the wings of the entrepreneurial Batman folk. Yeah, that does seem unfair. If there's actually a town called Batman, then I mean, too bad. Batman copyright owners. However, the rest of the claims are clearly a load of holy donuts. Ah, oh, but a bum bum tsh. Mayor Kalkin reckons that he could prove his city of Batman predated the predation. <laughs> that sounds like someone who's predating like a predator, but it's predated. That's a weird word. The creation of Bob Kane and Bill Finger's comic strip character in 1931, but this does beg the question as to why the city hadn't raised any objections when the comic strip was first launched or when the first films were released in the 1940s. Really? Holy sh**, was Batman from the 1940s? Wow. Or when the Camp TV series became a massive global success in the 1960s, or when Tim Burton revived the movie franchise with the epic blockbuster in 1989. Oh my god. Did we, did we run out? Did Hollywood run out of ideas? I mean, I know the answer to that is obviously yes. But then we get movies like, I just rewatched Interstellar. And I'm like, holy sh**, this is a fantastic original movie. And uh, yeah, it'd be nice to see more of that and less like redoing Spider-Man for the 500th time. And I, like, contrary to popular belief, like, I generally hate all the fantasy sh**, but I do, um, and also Marvel, I'm completely checked out of Marvel. Wait, is Batman Marvel or is that DC? I don't know, look. There are superhero movies I like. I enjoy the Spider-Man movies. I enjoy the Batman movies. I enjoy the Superman movies. I enjoy the Iron Man movies. Don't lie to me. Just the ones where they all get together and f***ing fight aliens who come into big cloud in the sky. I'm like, this is confusing. Like, I'm not smart enough to understand that. And I feel like, I don't know. <laughs> is everyone, like, I'm just like absolutely lost <laughs> as to what's going on in those movies. It does seem a bit odd that they waited until Christopher Nolan released the first ever film in the franchise uh, not to even have the word Batman in the bloody title. If we're being picky, it's also worth pointing out that this particular claim is not true anyway. The city was known as Illur until 1957 when it was renamed Batman after the nearby Batman River, which itself probably took its name from the shortening of a local mountain called Bati Raman. All right. Uh, so you didn't come up with... Oh, the, the, who cares? Can we stop... All I'm, I'm reading all of this, and most of my commentary is about the Batman movies, because the actual legal battle is like, oh my god, who gives a sh**? Why don't we just leave each other alone? Do we have to be suing each other over pointless sh** that no one cares about? Warner Brothers, leave them the f alone. Town of Batman, leave them the f alone. Judge Simon has spoken. Quit your bullshit. Yes, what's wrong with people? I do feel like I could really sort some of this out really fast. A cynic might suggest that Mayor Kalkin only set up, sat up and took notice when he saw that profits from the Dark Knight were sailing close to a billion dollars. Or another cynic might imagine that this was all just a massive publicity stunt to generate publicity and tourism for the obscure city of Capes Crusaders. There's no one, it's just a name. Nah. But the truth is probably a little bit more disturbing. The city had fallen on hard financial times by 2008. Shocking. And it's absolutely true that there was a rise in young female suicides. These were actually known as honor suicides when young women are discovered to have engaged in something as shocking as a premarital relationship. The culture often requires their own brothers to carry out a murder to avoid any shame falling on the family. Holy sh**, Turkey. What the f*** are you up to? I know people are like, Simon, you shouldn't judge other cultures. You shouldn't base your historical perspective and your, like, British culture and judge other people's culture. And I'm like, yo, 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 yo. Let me read the sentence again. <laughs> Let me read that sentence again. We tried a lot of tricky traps, but this one's a whole lot better. The culture often requires our own brothers to carry out her murder to avoid any shame falling on the family. In this case, absolutely fine with judging that as being batshit crazy and you should get your together. Are you still gonna kill me? 
Yeah. Um, but so, so it's cancel, Simon. <laughs> the Turkish hate mob is coming. Surely people in Turkey, like, it's always, this has got to be the most extremist people in Turkey. Because I've met Turkish people, they all seem extremely reasonable, nice people. It's always just like the stupid extremist people or the politicians who are just doing all this like, and what the f***? Stop it. Get some help. But some more considerate parents thought that this was a bit harsh, so they instead thoughtfully encouraged their daughters to avoid a brutal murder at the hands of their own brothers by just committing suicide instead. And in this case, f*** you parents, you piece of shit. My upbringing was painfully strict, ma'am. That's sweet. Um, during an interview with Mayor Kalkin at around this time, one local reporter had jokingly asked why the city hadn't sued the Batman franchise yet, as this would surely help raise a few dollars for the city coppers. And at that moment, the mayor's like, Ding! Sound light bubble above my head, please! Mayor Kalkin thought that this was genuine criticism of his administration, and so not only did he go ahead and sue Warner Brothers, he also tried to pin the blame for the honor suicides on the new Batman movie while he was at it. Yes, 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 it's got nothing to do with the uh, embedded culture of, of uh, brothers killing their sisters when they uh, have a premarital relationship. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. It's Batman's fault. F me. This is. What the f? Of course, the lawsuit didn't get anywhere at all because it was utterly f mental. But even a far more credible lawsuit would surely have a tough time in taking on the might and the power and the big bucks of a major movie corporation who are quite likely to have wildly expensive lawyers on speed dial. Yeah, I have a little bit of experience with that. Yo, so with uh, YouTube, if you include a clip, you know, say, I'm sure in this video there'll be like a couple of seconds of Batman or something, probably that Sam's inserted, like Batman memes. If Warner Brothers come along, they could be like, yo, fat boy, that two seconds that is clearly f***ing fair use, is clearly fair use, no question about it, like that is me. It's not like you've lost money, Warner Brothers, because I've used like two seconds of Batman in my clip, in my video. If anything, people are probably going to go and rent Batman and watch it again because it's awesome. It's a meme, Batman. I don't understand. And they'll be like, no, 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 fact boy, all of the money from that video, <coughs> it's coming to us. <coughs> Cough it up. And it's like, yeah, I could fight it. Actually, I can't. Actually, that is so f***ed up. If they, this is so boring for people who don't do YouTube, but they can either do two things. They can use the automatic copyright claiming system where it's just all of the money from that video automatically goes to them. Or they can copyright strike me, which is where the video gets taken down and I have to legally say like, yo, this is fair use and I'm willing to fight for it. And in that case, they can sue me. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, which I wouldn't do because it's Warner Brothers. Like if someone like some small person is like, oh, there was a ridiculous one lately where some guy, <laughs> I'm sorry, we are far on a tangent. Some, some idiot was like, yo, you used in one of your thumbnails a picture that I took of an artifact in the British Museum. And I'm like, mate. <laughs> and he's like, you didn't credit me. And I'm like, mate, it's, a, a, it's an ancient artifact that you took a photo of and put on Wikipedia. This is, how am I, like, fair use, there's four pillars. And they're all about like, am I hurting your business? Am I taking money from you? Is it unreasonable? And what's the nature of the content? Something like that. And seeing as my content is like all educational, and it's a picture of something you took in a f***ing museum, mate. You didn't make the original weird ass hieroglyph, and it's a tiny bit of the thumbnail. And so yeah, I had to spend my f***ing time sorting that nonsense out. And it's like, what the f*** is go what what is going on in my life? No one cares about this. Let's just get on with the script. So this is the most boring part of being a YouTuber, dealing with all that bullshit and crazy people. Uh, what is going on? What is going on? What is going on? Oh, the, and there's so many like that. There's so many people who think they're like, who just don't understand copyright law. And YouTube just make it so easy. Why am I back on this thing, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> so I was going to insert that one where it's like, uh, what's his face from that uh, super bad movie? Uh, God damn it. It's like, that's the greatest fucking story ever. Can I hear it again? Oh, Simon, what the fuck, dude? Just go, get on. <sighs> I got woken up at four o'clock this morning by my kid. Brilliant. And they just didn't go back to sleep. So that was fun. Stop it. Get some help. I'm totally lost. I don't even remember what this is about. <laughs> ah. So sorry. <laughs> Please don't cancel me. Sure thing, boss.
It's a, oh my god, was that where we left off? It's no great surprise that the overwhelming majority of lawsuits thrown in the direction of Hollywood just end up lining the litter tray of a supervillain's pet cat. It would be, take a brave David to even consider having a go at these Goliaths, but apparently the world is full of such fearless or foolish souls. Lights, camera, legal action! That was the introduction. Holy sh! Unsung heroes sailing away from the frankly frivolous into the choppier waters of the sincerely serious. Here's a lawsuit which wasn't actually leveled at Hollywood itself, but the allegedly misleading scenario depicted in the 2013 film Captain Phillips certainly helped to generate media attention for a lawsuit which reportedly helped to eradicate the threat of piracy in Samar excuse me, in Somali waters. Peter Greengrass's film starred Tom Hanks as the titular hero in a story, true story based on a dramatic incident that occurred in 2009. I just saw that Tom Hanks movie Greyhounds, which was very strange because it didn't seem to follow the like normal scripts, you know, like movies have things going on in them. They have like a plot. And of course this had a plot, but it was just like, it's a ship crossing the Atlantic and it's getting attacked. And I was like, Surely this is going to be really boring. There's no, like, storyline. And it was absolutely riveting, and Tom Hanks is a legend. Let's move on. Uh, the real-life captain, Richard Phillips, had taken command of the cargo vessel MV Maersk in Alabama with instructions to guide the crew and cargo through the... Gardafui... Gardafui... Gardafut... Gardafut... Channel to Mombasa in Kenya. Along the way, they were hijacked by Somali pirates, and Captain Phillips was taken hostage for three days by the armed pirates seeking a sizable ransom. The character portrayed by Tom Hanks is a typical American family man who got caught up in a perilous situation and ba bravely fought against the odds. At the beginning of the film, we see the conscientious Tom Hanks barking out instructions to his crew to tighten up security in a bid to eliminate the potential threats of attacks. And later on, following the boarding of the pirates, the heroically, he heroically persuades them to take a a hostage in order to save the lives of, his, lives of his crew, who were largely depicted as lazy, coffee-swilling deadbeats. Uh-oh. <laughs> the film went down a storm with critics, grossing $220 million from a $55 million budget, uh, and received six Academy Award nominations. Damn. I remember it being... I haven't seen this film in... What was it? 2009? 2013. Yeah, I don't. There's a lot. I don't really remember anything about it, but I do remember it being excellent. Uh, but there's a group of people who strongly disagree with this version of events, and it was the crew of the MV Maersk Alabama. Yeah, it's like, dude, you made me look like a complete coffee swilling idiot. Although, what's wrong with being coffee swilling? Some of the crew actually cooperated with the production of the movie, but in exchange for their $5,000 salary, they'd also been required to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which prevented them from ever publicly speaking about what exactly happened on their vessel in 2009. That's a very, very smart move by the uh, production company there. Because it's like, yeah, you did this work for us, and here's an NDA. And you'll be like, five grand? Sure, I'll consult on that. And then you realize you've signed this NDA, and you're like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. But the rest of the crew, who hadn't been gagged by Columbia Pictures, weren't exactly big fans of the movie. They reckoned that the real Richard Phillips was a sullen and arrogant captain with a bad reputation. Phillips himself admits that he received several emails warning, warning him of a likely threat from pirates, but he chose not to share them with the crew. Wait, so not only were the crew actually, like, competent, or it's, I don't know, maybe they were, but also the captain wasn't as heroic as the movie portrayed. And his crew members <laughs> alleged that they were practically begging Captain Phillips not to sail too close to the Somali coast, but he ignored them as he was more interested in taking a shortcut which would save time and money. Uh-oh. After the pirates boarded, they should remake this movie. <laughs> With, like, Tom Hanks playing the bad guy. they just, like, reshoot it, redo it, and just be like, yeah, this is the alternative version. That'd be kind of fun. Tom Hanks probably wouldn't go for that, though. But if you're interested, Tom, just, uh, hit me up, all right? We can, uh, work on it together. It'll be fun. <laughs> That'd be great, working on a movie with Tom Hanks. Legend. I love Tom Hanks. Big fan. After the Pirates bought... Controversial statement. Who isn't, the fa who isn't a fan of Tom Hanks? It was like... Uh, um, was it an Onion article? Which is like... It, it was like right in the middle of the Me Too movement. And it's like, Tom Hanks accused of... Dot, 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 being a really nice guy. And it's like, yeah, of course. Tom Hanks. Such a legend. Um, blah 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 blah
After the pirates boarded, it was the crew who took heroic action fighting back against their attackers. The captain was standing around wondering if this might be an appropriate time for a fire drill before he eventually got captured. <laughs> Meanwhile, the crew managed to seize the chief pirate, disable all the systems, and lock themselves downstairs where they planned to use their pirate prisoner as a bargaining chip for the release of Phillips. The captain never voluntarily gave himself up to save his crew. Instead, the prisoner exchange got screwed up and Phillips was grabbed by the pirates as they made off in a lifeboat with their hostage. He would be rescued by the US, by US Navy marksmen three days later. That did happen in the movie, right? I vaguely remember the... the there was... Was the, the... Right? It's often... I mean, I don't know. It's often wrongly reported that the disgruntled crew filed legal action against the producers of the movie, but in fact the movie just unwittingly helped to highlight their cause. The lawsuit had... What's their cause, though? They're not suing anybody. They're just... They're just a crew of a ship, right? The lawsuit had actually been filed against the shipping and contract companies in the immediate aftermath of the incident. Oh, okay. Eleven of the crew members were seeking compensation for physical and emotional damages after the co companies willfully sent employees into pirate-invested waters with wanton and conscious disregard for their safety. You know, often I'm like, what are you doing? Just stop it with your stupid lawsuits. This is fucking justified, and I hope they get a lot of money. The lawsuit was later settled for an undisclosed but probably very substantial bag of loot. Excellent. And more important, it's always disappointing when they settle, though, because you don't find out how much it was because there's probably like an NDA on that because they're like we don't want to tell you how much we paid out and that's kind of why we're settling because we don't want to set a precedent for massive sums of money paid out uh but it is disappointing i'd love to know how much it was i hope they got rich and more importantly and encourage shipping companies to spend more money on armed security effectively eliminating the risk of pirate attacks in somali waters good that all worked out for everyone but perhaps Tom Hanks would have been better off playing one of the crew members in the movie. Captain Phillips may have been the guy who was hailed as a hero, enjoying coffee and biscuits with President Obama, and then dined out on the fame with a memoir and a movie. Wait, he really did? That's some mega bullshit right there. It was the Valiant crew who had reportedly put up the bitter fight and were ultimately victorious against both the cutthroat pirates and the equally cutthroat shipping companies. Um, I mean, <laughs> the shipping company in this case is bad. Like, they, they, they sailed them too close, and that's why they had to settle. But equating them to the f***ing pirates, Danny? Because they know. The pirates are clearly worse. What are you talking about? <laughs> Equally cut throats? The pirates literally cut people's throats. The shipping companies are just... I mean, as we've talked about many times, they're just interested in saving time and money. They're not cutthroat. I mean, that is technically cutthroat, but it's not literally cutthroat. Ah, but before we get into the rest of today's video, let me tell you about today's wonderful sponsor, Squarespace. Yes, that's right. Squarespace are back again, as they are every month. I mean, Squarespace is like the ongoing glorious partner that are, that it's just really nice to have every month because, I mean, obviously, it's working out. It's working out for them. It's working out for me. It's working out for you guys who go and get Squarespace. Whatever it is idea for a small business, web store, sports blog, creative portfolio, or just a page of the dankest memes. Yes, it's all possible on Squarespace. If you can dream it, you can build it. You're looking to get in and out quick without thinking too much about what your website should look like? Mm, no problem. Use one of their quick, beautiful templates to make a website that is fresh and for you. Or maybe you're more of a hands-on person. Oh yeah, that's another one. It's like, I w I'm a template boy. Like, go in there, pick a template, it looks wonderful, boom, bada bing, bada boom. You got yourself a website. But if you're like design inclined, which I'm absolutely not, you can uh, make a website yourself that looks how you want it to be. It's all very customizable. And then there are no updates, no patches, no technical nonsense to worry about. No one hates Wait, no one hates? No one likes technical nonsense. Once you're done setting up your website, tinkering with the design, there's loads of extra features. What are those extra features, fact boy? Yes, email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support, and breathe. Everything you want is in one place. So when you're ready to get started on the next project of yours, big, small, do it with Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your new site, go to squarespace.com forward slash blaze. I was checking the link and you'll save 10% off, uh, off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And back to today's video. A Tale of Two Fishes. Disney and Pixar may have been flushed with success from the release of the 2003 animated classic Finding Nemo, but then dubious allegations came bubbling to the surface regarding... Where exactly they found Nemo? Well, he's digital, isn't he? Right? It's not like they cast some real fish in the... I'm probably way off beat here. A French author by the name of Frank Le Calvez, or Frank Le Calvez, reckons that they stole him from the pages of his children book, 
Piero the Clown Vich, which was published a whole year earlier. A whole year earlier? It takes them more than a year, like, from concept to completion. It's like when I release a video on, like, one of my many channels, it's like, ah, Simon, you copied this other channel. They released a video about it one day ago. It's happened, like, uh, like last week. I can't remember what it was. There was some video that I literally released, like, on the same topic 45 minutes after another dude in, like, the educational space released a video on it. And I just was like, yeah, yeah, well, I saw his video and I just knocked one out in 45 minutes to, to kind of dick on him. And it's like, yeah, it's not how it works. <laughs> Even when it's like weeks later. The, the, the stuff, this, this was probably come up with like a good month and a half ago, the idea for this. So, it's all nonsense. For starters, on a purely visual... Wait, what am I going on? No, no, no. And they do appear to be more than a few passing similarities between his little illustrated book, which enjoyed only a modest print run in France in 2002, and the global blockbuster movie from Disney, which emerged the following year. For starters, on a purely visual level, Nemo could be the twin brother of the clownfish depicted in Frank's book. Well, obviously. Because they're both clownfish. Sporting the same three stripes, raised fin, and jolly big, jolly smile. Yeah, it's an anthropomorphized clownfish. What else do you want it to look like? Judge Simon has spoken! The book and the film also share similar story themes and supporting characters, including a sturgeonfish and a cleaner shrimp, who are practically identical in their print and movie incarnations. So, could it be that Dan uh, Din Danny and Pixar, Disney and Pixar, blatantly copied Frank's book on their way to developing what would become the second highest grossing film of the year? And the cinema audience just fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker? It might seem a little unlikely considering that an animated feature of this scale usually takes a bit longer than a year to get from script to screen. Yeah, and they've also got to develop the script. I mean, it's a hugely long process. But Franck Le Cave claims that he originally registered his version of the Clownfish as a trademark as early as 1995 when he was pitching the idea for an animated movie called Pierrot the Clownfish to French production companies. Nothing ever emerged from this, and Frank eventually decided to produce an illustrated children's book instead. But the suggestion was that his original storyboards and concept art got passed around the production companies and animation studios, and eventually ended up in the hands of Disney, who decided to turn the ideas into a movie without ever bothering to consult Frank. Well, that's a very interesting theory, and if you have absolutely any evidence of that whatsoever, please come back to Judge Simon and maybe you'll change his mind until you present, a, you know, less, more than a, more than a f nothing of evidence. Let's just ignore that, shall we? Shall we? Following the release of the movie, Frank was particularly upset when he discovered that French bookstores were now refusing to stock his book as they felt it was cheap plagiarism of Finding Nemo. Frank originally sued Disney and Pixar for an undisclosed portion of the movie's spin-off books and merchandise sold in French shops. But the French courts ruled in 2004 that although the two fishes shared some of the same qualities, they were not similar enough to confuse the public. Frank was a resilient sort of chap, though, and he came back all gills blazing uh, 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 with a second lawsuit in 2005. This time he was claiming a million euros in damages from Disney and Pixar, but this was a lawsuit he would ultimately regret filing. Oh boy. <laughs> ah, you have decided to sue Disney, have you? <laughs> Maybe you'll regret that. I'm just a man! <laughs> The French courts looked deeper into the matter and came to the conclusion that Frank was nothing more than a felonous, fly-by-night fishy fraudster. There was no evidence of him registering the trademark for Perot in 1995 or ever pitching his ideas to production companies. Oh, Judge Simon, you're such a legend. Ah, come back to me. What did I say? Come back to me with more than nothing of evidence? It's not real, is it? And the book was published under odd circumstances, too. Frank had actually paid out about $71,000 to self-publish a print run of just 2,000 copies. Oh my god, how much are you paying per copy? That's insane. An investment which he never clawed back, even if his book had sold out. And although Piero Piero the Clownfish was indeed published a year before Finding Nemo, we have to remember that the Disney hype machine often goes into overdrive long before a film is released. Oh, get the fuck up! Get the fuck up! Oh, did you see that was coming? and shadily release a quick book. You dodgy bastard. Allegedly. Images and plot snippets from the forthcoming movie were already available on the internet by the time Frank got round to writing a book which was designed solely to try and deceitfully swindle Disney into forking out for a big settlement. Frank was ordered to pay the equivalent of around $80,000 in damages and legal fees to Disney and Pixar. Which makes me think Disney and Pixar's lawyers were actually quite reasonably priced. <laughs> Which is an insane statement. <laughs> but that didn't deter him from penning a sequel to the book in 2009 called Piero the Clownfish, The Black Cloud. Seven years later, Disney released Finding Dory. Coincidence? Yes. <laughs> yes. Drill harder. Although many films generally attract lawsuits for contentious scenes that were shown to the audience, this is an odd case of a mighty movie corporation shelling out for a settlement 
for a very brief scene that ended up on the cutting room floor. In the scene in question was from the 1990 blockbuster sequel Die Hard 2. My favorite Die Hard, I think. I mean, they're all excellent, even the new ones, but that is Die Hard 2. Uh, uh, or some people could like to call it the one in the airport. We all know what it is. It's brilliant. Oh, I don't know. Nakatomi Plaza, though. Mm. Oh my god, Die Hard's so good. I gotta watch Die Hard again. The fleeting scene only lasted seconds, and it simply showed Bruce Willis as John McClane unscrewing an air duct in the airport tunnel. There might not seem to be anything too significant about this, except that John McClane's tool of choice for this specialist job was the funky new Univolt drill from Black & Decker. The budget for Die Hard 2 had been spiraling out of control, and his rumored to have cost around $17 million in the end, which seems positively reasonable today. This was a significant leak from the relatively modest $28 million budget of the 1988 original classic, or the one in the skyscraper. So. So, in order to help get a bit more money flowing into production for 20th Century Fox, they resorted to the idea of product placement. They entered an agreement with Black & Decker to show off the new Univolt drill in all its practical and efficient glory in a return for a payment of $20,000 from the power tool manufacturer. I mean, that's it? That's it? You can get, like, your Black & Decker, Decker drill in Die Hard 2 for 20 grand? I want to put, like, business blaze in a movie. I'd place someone... I, that, is a, that is a deal. That is an absolute deal. That sounded like a good deal on both sides. Also, what the fuck? How is $20,000 going to make a dent in your $70 million production thing? It's absurd. Black & Decker got free promotion in a film that would seem but free promotion, Danny. They paid $20,000 for it. Math, <laughs> math is math. Okay, math Dad. is math. Uh, seen by tens of millions of customers, whilst Fox now are just to find the $69,980,000 that remained. Yes, exactly. Black & Decker even developed a big marketing campaign for the Univolt to tie in with the release of the movie, which coincided nicely with the lead-up to Father's Day. And that whole marketing campaign, I can guarantee you, cost a f**k ton more than $20,000. It's not clear what exactly they had planned, but the campaign would apparently have leaned heavily on the Die Hard connection, even if the connection was just a few seconds long and involved an air duct grill. So, you can imagine how annoyed they must have felt when they learned only three days before the film was due to be released that the director had decided to cut the scene with the Univolt. Well, they have to give the money back, don't they? Oh, and Black & Decker are going to sue them for the ton of money that they spent on making the uh, that big marketing campaign. Uh-oh. It depends what the contract says. I mean, there's probably some line in there about, yeah, it might get cut out and we'll refund you the money. I imagine they put that in the contract, right? Black & Decker filed a lawsuit against Fox for their advertising agency and their advertising agency, Crown Young and Rubicam, claiming that the cutscene had led to a loss of credibility. This was actually a piece of history as it was the first uh, known lawsuit to involve product placement in a movie. Really? Oh my god, were we just not doing lawsuits in the past? Or we had a product placement that never actually happened. And the really curious thing is the Black & Decker hadn't even got around to paying the $20,000 pay product placement fee in the first place, which is why the director felt he had the freedom to cut the scene. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's not how contracts work, but okay. But Fox hadn't realized the Black & Decker had spent, Decker had spent a six-figure sum, told you so, on putting together a promotional tie-in campaign which had been swiftly pulled as it no longer made sense. Fox and the advertising agency settled out of court for a reported $150,000, and nobody got a Univolt for Father's Day that year. Fox really should have known to try harder. Ah, but a bum bum a journalist abroad. While some studios may give themselves a pat on the back for fending off a pesky lawsuit or two, you haven't really done a good job of offending your audience with your latest movie unless you find yourself spending more time dealing with a relentless list of lawsuits than you ever did on making the bloody film. Are you guys working? Yes, sir, Mr. Simpson. And Borat might just be a contender for one of the most litigious films ever produced. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, in every way, it offended so many people and nations and everything. I'm not surprised. I mean, it's utterly brilliant, but it is. I mean, dude, people are gonna, there's a lot of people looking like idiots in that movie. I take a shit. <laughs> She's my sister. Released in 2006 under the name Borat, Cultural Learnings of America for Make Benefit Glorious Nation of Kazakhstan. 
The Fox movie was the first big screen outing for Sacha Baron Cohen's fictional Kazakh journalist Borat. The enthusiastic and naive reporter with an alarmingly regressive worldview travels to the US where he encounters the real life, Ameri real life Americans in a string of unscripted comical vignettes. And under his disguise as an innocent, befuddled foreigner with a tendency to exhibit inappropriate behavior and attitudes, Borat often coaxes suspicious and shocking admissions from his unsuspecting victims. Critics might suggest that the whole wacky stunt is designed to humiliate everyday folk in front of an audience of millions for cheap comical effect. Yeah, it's also brilliant though, isn't it? Great success. Others prefer to reason that Shasha Baron Cohen is using the character of Borat to highlight the absurd prejudices and beliefs bubbling just under the surface of the people who might live right next door to you. Yes. Whatever the intention, the results are eye-opening, mind-boggling, and brilliantly funny. But of course, the problem is that many of Borat's co-stars weren't very happy about being made to look silly in one of the biggest movies of the year. And the lawsuits were piling up as high as the cinema ticket stubs. Yeah, I mean, you've got to sign a release though, right? So how do they get all these guys to sign releases? To appear in this movie when they just make you look like a racist fuck. You'd be like, uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not signing that release. There's absolutely no way. So did they just not get releases and then get sued? But I mean, movie people are crazy about releases. Like, uh, it's, it's, yeah, so I don't know. Driving instructor Michael Pesenitska had been paid $500 to give the fictional Borat a film driving lesson, which descended into chaos when Borat began drinking alcohol at the wheel, yeah. My name is Borat. Okay, okay, good, good. Well, I'm not used to that, but that's fine. <laughs> Driving erratically <laughs> and yelling obscenities at pedestrians. Michael claims that he had been misled into believing that the film was a serious documentary and demanded damages of $100,000 from Fox and Baron Cohen. But the case was dismissed as Michael had signed a release when Foreman accepting his $500 check. Yeah, that's how they do it. It's like, yeah, yeah, you made it look like a bit of an idiot, but do you want this $500 or not? Because if you do, we want a signature. And yeah, then you, you don't really know what you're signing a release for, do you? I mean, you're still being, yeah. Yeah, okay, very clever. Good job. Kathy Martin ran an etiquette school in Alabama and had been tasked with teaching Boris some modern American manners and transforming him into a gentleman. Things didn't pan out very well during an evening dinner party that she hosted for her pupil, during which Bora politely asked to be excused to visit the bathroom, but then returned to the table holding a plastic bag containing his own feces. <laughs> Kathy claimed that she'd been tricked into taking part in a childish prank and that her business had been ruined. The case was again dismissed as Kathy had signed a release form. Yeah, those release forms are pretty powerful, eh? Ah, oh, the residents of an entire village in Romania suit, but you are kind of signing that release form under like, uh, I guess they're very careful not to say that it's a documentary. Even though it is, I guess, technically a documentary. Is Borat a documentary? Kinda. Um, wow. This is, uh, I mean, I guess Fox's lawyers thought about this longer than Fact Boy here, so, well, good for them. <clears throat> uh, the residents of an entire village in Romania sued Fox for no less than $30 million following their unflattering portrayal in the movie. The village of Glod was used as a backdrop for Borat's hometown, but the residents claimed that they had not been made aware of the true nature of the film and were angered that they had been portrayed as incestuous and ignorant rapists, abortionists, prostitutes, thieves, racists, and simpletons. This is my town of Kusek. This is Orkin, the town rapist. Naughty, naughty. The case for this one was dismissed as the judge felt the charges were too vague to stand up in court. That surprises me a little bit. Uh, one of the more famous lawsuits involved two fraternity brothers from the University of South Carolina. Oh my god, this one is savage. Yeah, no doubt. Christopher Rotunda and J Justin Say were filmed enjoying a friendly drink with Borat and coming out with vile, racist, and sexist comments. The frat boys. Why are you signing a release, dudes? What the fuck? The frat boys claimed that the producers had plied them with booze beforehand to loosen them up a bit, and they'd been told that the footage would never be shown in the US. Mate. They're just saying that. What does it say in the release? But also, if they're drunk when they're signing the release, then that's not that's that's going to be pretty solidly arguable. They now reckon that the film had impacted their career prospects. Yeah, no shit, my dudes. No fucking shit. Because uh, yeah, we saw Borat. <laughs> And the one upstanding citizens and the ones upstanding citizens have become objects of ridicule and humiliation in their community. Are women your slaves in Russia? No. Do you have a slaves here? 
We no wish. slaves. No we slaves. Wish. It is a shame. And Bodak. The release one they signed didn't exactly help their cause, although they later had a go at getting their scenes cut from the subsequent DVD release, and the case was also dismissed. Those release forms played a crucial role in many other lawsuits that came flying into the air intros of Fox. Apparently, the forms were very careful and explicitly worded, but also, of course, the problem is that not many of the people can be asked to read the small prints. Yeah, no, that's legally tricky. I don't know how it works in the US, but if there's major clauses in a contract in like, I don't know if this is different, and I learned about this a long time ago, but if there's like a major thing in a contract that is like, they, where the, you know, it's like where they try to sneak it in there. It's like, yeah, 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 you know, and your firstborn child. You know, if you're signing some contract for like your credit cards and they're like, and your firstborn child, they have to put that in big, bold red because it's a major thing. I don't know if that's the case in the US or whether they can still like slip shit in there. Um, I don't know. But you got to read your contracts, guys. But that doesn't tend to help much in court. There's a reason, there's probably a re uh, lesson to be learned here somewhere. Read your contracts. From all the lawsuits filed against Borat, there was only one that resulted in a settlement. It was a bit of an odd case. The Macedonian Romani singer uh, Esma Rejabova sued Fox for 800,000 euros after claiming that she hadn't been asked for permission to use her song Che Shukarie, in w which was often heard in the background whenever we cut to scenes of Borat's, Borat's hometown. The weird thing about this one is that producers indeed secured rights to use the song from Esma's production house, but nobody at the production house had bothered telling Esma about it. <laughs> Incompetent. So for some unfathomable reason, this meant that Fox Hat was liable to pay Esma compensation. What the f***? <laughs> That's one of those things where it's like, how on earth am I, where Fox would be like, what the f***, guys, why are we liable for this sh We paid you, what the hell? Uh, yeah, this is why, yeah, the law's weird. That's one of the things where I'll be like, yeah, I'm getting sued. <laughs> it, I imagine this is something that would happen to me, and I'll be like, oh, what the f*** did I do? What the f***? How was I supposed, well, I'm not responsible for how they do business, what the f***? I'm just a man! <laughs> Anyway, let's move on. Although the singer was ultimately only awarded 26,000 euros of the 800,000 euros that she was demanding, which to Fox is like, uh, yeah, I got that right here. <laughs> sure, go away. Peasant. Um, Sasha Baron Cohen never seemed too phased about the lawsuits. When he picked up the award for best actor at the following year's Golden Globe Awards, he made the point of joking, thank you to every American who has not sued me so far. <laughs> But bearing in mind all the headaches of likely litigation, you ought to think that a big movie corporation would maybe think twice about daring to make another Borat film. <laughs> in fact, Fox Universal were practically fighting over the opportunity to make the sequel of Borat's subsequent movie film, which was eventually released by Amazon Studios in 2020. How have I not seen that? Is that the one with his, uh, the girl who plays his daughter? I've, I can't believe I've missed that. Go to the church and ask God to forgive you. And yes, the lawsuit started trickling before the sequel had even been shown on a cinema screen. Holy predictable, Batman! Yes, this has been an episode of Braze. Bra da -da -da Brain Blaze, thank you so much for watching. Yo, 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 you want to get a free Danny shirt? This is, a, I don't know when this is going out, but until the end of November, you are able to purchase a free Danny or keep Danny shirt, and the money shall go to Danny. For the free one, I keep all the money for the keep one. And I'm looking at the stats, people are buying the free Danny one more, and I'm like, capitalist hearts. <laughs> uh, but yes, you can go to purchasemerch.co, pick up a t-shirt, and uh, that would be fantastic. Thank you for watching. I'm sorry, we are far on a tangent.